Welcome to Sharing Our Stories, the podcast where the vibrant tapestry of our community unfolds through the voices of its residents. Brought to you by the Chilton Public Library, this series invites you to embark on a journey of discovery as we delve into the personal narratives, cherished memories, and unique experiences that make our town truly special. Join us as we celebrate the diverse stories that weave together the fabric of Chilton, Wisconsin, one captivating tale at a time. Sit back, listen, and let the power of storytelling connect us all. This is Sharing Our Stories. Welcome to another episode of Sharing Our Stories. At Chilton Public Library, I'm Glennie Whitcomb with Pauline Geyser here today, March 5th, 2024. Welcome, Pauline. It's good to be chatting with you today. Yeah, thank you for asking me about this. Yeah, yeah. and I know you grew up on a farm yes. in the area. Yes, south and, of Chilton. Yes, and so was it a dairy farm? Yes. And how many people did it support? How many people were in your family? Um, <clears throat> there were eight children come from a family of eight brothers and sisters, and our uncle also lived with us mm-hmm. on the farm, besides mom and dad. Mm-hmm. And do you remember how many cows back yes. then? You do? Yes. We had 25 cows. And that supported a family? Yes. We also raised pigs. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember the chickens, but they also had chickens. Mm-hmm. But I don't remember that part. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, and my uncle lived with us, but my dad, he not only dairy farmed, but he also ran a business with a a big red truck. That's what I remember as a kid. Hmm. And my uncle would be running, um, like, beets, picking up beets from farmers, taking them up to Green Bay. Like to a canning factory? Yes, to a canning factory. He would haul gravel for people, mm-hmm. sand for people. Mm-hmm. And my uncle also did the morning milk route for the cheese factory in Charlesburg, mm-hmm. which was only two miles away. Mm-hmm. Charlesburg is where I went to school for eight years, mm-hmm. parochial school, and our Catholic parish was there. Mm-hmm. So that was a nice little community. Everybody knew everybody. What was the name of that school? St. Charles. St. Charles. St. Charles Catholic School. Is yes. it still there? No. Mm-hmm. No, it uh, shut down the year I graduated. Oh. I always kind of said that they gave up after they had our class. <laughs> <laughs> I hardly think so. But <laughs> well, I just make a joke. On yes, I know. That's mm-hmm. a good way to think yeah. about it. So um, then from did you go, what sh- high school did you go to then after that? It was funny because um, Charlesburg students got split between the Hulstein and Chilton. Mm-hmm. We went to Chilton. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then, in fact, only like a half a mile up the road, that was the borderline between Chilton and the Holstein School District. Mm-hmm. And those kids on that road got to choose what school oh, wow. they wanted to go mm-hmm. to. So some on that road went to Holstein, and first cousins of mine went to Chilton. So, Did you grow up doing chores before you went to school or after you came home or both? Um, after. After school, mainly. Um, my dad died when I was only seven, mm. and there was seven of us really at home yet. Mm-hmm. So by the time I was 13, yes, I was getting up, helping with milking morning and night. And my brother, who was five years older than me, he was doing the milking before he went to school in the morning. Um, yeah, we just all pitched in wherever mm-hmm. it was needed and... You, it didn't even you didn't even question it. You mm-hmm. just pitched in. That's the way it was. And your mother was able to continue the family farm business. Yes, yes, that's remarkable. Yes, I remember the spring. Um, my dad died April twenty fourth, and I remember one day after the funeral, all the neighbors came together and they planted for us. Oh. I mean, there must have been like three, four tractors with seed, mm. you know, grain drills in the fields and doing this and doing that. And I just remember that as a child. Yeah. You know, I was only seven at the time. But now when I think back at it, mm-hmm. that's what farming and community living is all about, is, is having your neighbors back mm-hmm. whenever they are in distress. And as a young child, I remember seeing my mom many times writing out a card or something on the kitchen table and say, oh, who has a birthday? 
Mm-hmm. Oh, no, this isn't a birthday card. This is a thinking of you card that I send because so-and-so is having a tough time. Mm-hmm. You know, you just you just did that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It, so you had it was great... a good place. It was a good place to grow up. Mm-hmm. And I could see you that you had formative role models who yes. showed you how to be. Yes. My mother, I always said, was liberated long before women's lib came around. Um, she kept the family farm. She continued to raise the rest of her kids on that farm. Um, she was a very strong woman in her faith and even in the community. Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, she was she was a great example. She really mm-hmm. was. Now, when you finished high school then, heart palpitations... <laughs> I understand you married. Yes. And then also farmed. Yes. I married my high school sweetheart. How wonderful. Yes. We started dating, I remember the day, May 3rd, 1969. Mm -hmm. He was a senior and I was a freshman. Uh Uh-huh. Which back then was kind of, you know, he was an older, older gentleman. Anyway, um... We we just hit it off. We both came from farming communities, mm-hmm. farming you know farming lives, and um, we dated for four years before we married. Mm-hmm. Yes. So. Um, and did you move right onto a farm? Or was he which no, farm? In fact, um, my husband was in computer programming ah. at the time. He had went to tech school for computer programming, and um, he in fact lived in Columbus, Ohio, for close to a year where. It, um, the company that he's working for sent him down there to set up the entire program for mm-hmm. them in their company. Mm-hmm. So he was gone, and I had went to one year of tech school. I was going to go go for child care and development. Um, and then we married, and he was not happy with with his job. It just it was very stressful. He says, "I can't see myself doing this." He says, and I says, "Well." You know, what do you want to do? And, and he says, well, how about if we farm? And I says, that's fine. I loved farming. I, I liked the outside work. In fact, when he married me, I could actually work better out in the barn or in the fields better than what I could throw a meal together. <laughs> 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 so, yes, and we bought a farm outright. Um, it was really run down. We had went to his father and asked for advice. But, of course, Joe comes, my husband came from a family of 13, mm-hmm. so his mom and dad were very smart. Mm-hmm. They never gave advice to any of their kids. It was, you make your own decisions, and you live by them. And it was funny because, and he didn't. He, he didn't offer his advice whether we should buy it or not. Well, we found out through the grapevines from other brothers and sisters that he thought we were nuts. <laughs> 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 but um, Joe and I were just... A very good team. Um, We both worked very hard. We lived very frugally. um, And it was a good place to raise our three Mm -hmm. children. Um, We instilled in our three kids a good work ethic, Mm -hmm. being proud of a job well done. Mm -hmm. And and I don't care how small of a job, even if it was picking stones, you were out there and and you did the work. That's hard work. yeah, we did. They did the work that was requested of them, and you know it was cute because um, we told them, "Hey, do some of your friends at school want to earn some money? We'll pay them. They can come out here and pick stones with us." And that is what we did through all those high school years of our three kids that they brought friends out when mm. it was stone picking time mm-hmm. or bailing hay time. That makes it so much more fun. It is, and you get it's, a lot more it, done. It's a lot more fun, and also. You know, it kind of gave those other kids absolutely the, um, the the chance to see what a farm is all about mm-hmm. and what it means to pitch in and help, mm-hmm. regardless if you're asked or not. Mm-hmm. You know that that was just that was just part of part of the family unit. So, how many years did you have your farm? Thirty one. Thirty one years. Thirty one years. And then there's a really good story about how that all transpired. Yeah. Um, I'm, 
I'm very strong in my faith. And I would be in the tractor chopping hay for, you know, six, seven hours a day or however long, you know, we had to do it. And I would always pray the rosary. And one of my prayers was, dear Lord, when it's time for us to sell, please send, send someone to buy it. I just thought that that <laughs> Sorry was... Sorry for laughing, Pauline, but you're, you're out there on your tractor praying for someone Sorry, to buy, buy them. <laughs> But when and time, I understand. Yeah, yeah. But when the time was right, okay? <laughs> yes. Well, it landed up that here, um, Joe was only 53 and I was only 50, and it landed up that some Amish people, two families had already bought places in our neighborhood. We didn't even realize it. And then the third Amish family drove past our place with the realtor that they were working with and said, boy, that's a nice looking place. Well, it landed up that our son married the realtor's daughter. So the realtor called our son Nick and said, hey, this Amish gentleman is interested in your dad's farm. Do you think your dad would show it? Nick says, well, sure. He says, I, I can ask him and see what's, what's going to happen. So Joe said, sure, bring him out. And okay, they came on a Friday afternoon. I think it was a Friday. And they came about one o'clock. Well, at the present time, I was working at the local factory in Chilton, and I was on second shift. So I had to get to be to work by 2 o'clock. They showed him the house, and then I had to leave. They, and they continued then to show him the barn and the cows. And I mean, we were totally automated, okay? Mm -hmm. We had like five silos. We had conveyors through the barn for feeding cows automatically. We had, you know, how large? How cleaners. large was your herd? We had sixty-five, mm. sixty-five cows, and mm -hmm. we raised all our young stock mm -hmm. also and stuff. And we never hired help. It was our children that helped us. And then um, afterwards, when our kids started leaving, well, it was just really Joe and I mm -hmm. and stuff. So anyway, I left for work that Friday night, and then so I got home, went to bed, and then I usually got in the barn about seven. And my husband says to me, well, the realtor's coming and he's going to talk to us over breakfast about selling. And I looked at him and I said, who's selling? And he says, you don't want to? And I says, you do? And he says, let's just sit down with the realtor and find out what we have here. He said, you yeah. know, because when, when you're farming, you have all of your money stuck in the farm. Mm -hmm. You have no savings. You really don't. I mean, I, I thought I was rich when I had 20 bucks in my purse. Mm -hmm. You know, so it all gets it, reinvested it, it all into gets the reinvested, farm. Okay. So we really never sat down and figured out what we were worth. So that morning, the realtor came out and he sat down and um, he told us what the Amish family wanted. He didn't want all the land. He just wanted the buildings and the land around the buildings and the 20 acres across the road. So that would leave us like another 100 acres, you know, that was like about a mile and a half away. He didn't want the cows. He didn't want the machinery. What their plans were was to raise from little calves on up and then build that way mm -hmm. and then start milking and stuff. So, okay, so we sat down and figured out, okay, you know, what's this worth? What's that worth? Well, so we gave them an amount that we thought was appropriate. Well, they came back <laughs> with with a counter amount. And we says, okay. We sat down with our kids, and we told them this situation that came up. And our kids said, Mom and Dad, if you don't take this, you're nuts. <laughs> I mean, it was far more than what I ever dreamt mm -hmm. that we would ever get. Plus, that really didn't include selling of the cows selling the machinery or mm, the right. other parcel of land that we had. <clears throat> so believe it or not, this was, they wanted us out in four weeks. That is totally impossible to get a farm. Mm -hmm. I mean, your whole life of 31 years out of the house, getting the cows ready for auction, lining up the machinery, where were we going to store that mm -hmm. in neighbor's barns or wherever we could find it. We said, no, we need eight weeks. Mm -hmm. 
they came back and they said, six weeks or the deal is not happening. <laughs> so, in a matter of okay. six Okay. Yes, I know. So, I guess in a matter of six weeks, yes, um, I cleaned the house out. I told my kids, you come and get your stuff <laughs> because <laughs> they had stuff left here mm-hmm. and they're already out of our house. And then we had to start, of course, working with um, an auctioneer for the cows, getting them ready um, because you just don't have an auction. You mm-hmm. have to have the cows clipped, you know, everything cleaned up, everything looking nice. And on September, I believe, um, 9th, I even forget the year. I'm sorry, I forget the year. That's okay. Um, September 9th, they came in our yard, the auctioneer that was going to handle the selling of the cows, setting up a big tent in our yard and then uh, a fenced-off area where one cow at a time comes out and people bid on it and stuff. And while this was happening, I was sitting in our kitchen area and the tears just came mm-hmm. because it was like wow this the, is it this the is, end of an era yeah the the end um it took some adjusting joel got a job immediately uh, that was the thing i was concerned about was where where was joel gonna mm-hmm. you know fit in here now with with working but um stockbridge manufacturing um they wanted him mm-hmm. um they said, no, we want you to come down, and we want you to work for you. And he worked there over 20 years. Mm-hmm. In fact, he's still working there now, mm-hmm. just um, do, making deliveries on Fridays. Mm-hmm. Um, I landed up being able to, um, I quit at the factory, and I took care of our grandchildren for oh, seven nice. to eight years in their homes when nice. their moms worked. Mm-hmm. So they did not have, they didn't, they weren't in daycare all week, mm-hmm. just certain days of the week. Mm-hmm. And that was the best thing that could have ever happened because I've, we have some very close relationships with our grandkids. That's because wonderful. Of that. Yeah, yeah, it, it was really nice, and um, and of course I then picked up a job at the um, Chilton Public Elementary lunchroom. Mm-hmm. I worked there for six years, and then of course here at the library I also worked. Mm-hmm. I still I had my fifteen year plaque. I believe it's going to be three years ago. Mm-hmm. And I'm still here and enjoying it immensely. And we are glad you are here. And not only are we glad you are here, but I do think we need to mention that Pauline Geyser is the Chilton 2024 Citizen of the Year. And we are thrilled to announce that. (laughs) And, and And for good reason. For There's good reason that you are all that you do. Would you say... Moving to town, like so, you've now experienced city living and rural living in different phases of life. Did one way of life versus another allow you more or less like civic involvement? Oh yes, definitely. When when I was when we were on the farm, I I didn't do. I can say I honestly didn't do anything. Well, there was no towards, time. There, there really was no time. <laughs> you were doing if, everything. If, if you're on the farm and you got three kids, plus for 11 years mm-hmm. I worked in the factory. Okay? Mm-hmm. Yes, I was spread very thin then. But once we got off the farm, then is when I could I nurtured our grandchildren. And at that time, then is when I got more active in our church, Good Shepherd Parish, mm-hmm. you know, in Chilton. Um religious ed teacher um when our kids were little in fact i did i did um help with the sunday school program mm-hmm. i was one of the original people that started the sunday school program nice. up at good shepherd when mm-hmm. our kids were little but then um you know you help out in school yes you do what you can and then once i was here in town then i got back into school i was an aide I worked for, I think, at least seven years on their big fundraiser every fall, uh, Toast to Our Future. Um, that was that was a wonderful experience working with the younger parents and, mm-hmm. you know, seeing things change, um, the, ways you, the way you raise your kids change. <laughs> Not saying I was for the better, but, <laughs> but, but they, they manage, you know, and stuff. Um, yeah, 
definitely it gave me more time to be able to put into mm -hmm. the, the civic part of it. And the experience you had learning about being so busy on a farm, knowing how to work and get things done on a farm gives you certain skills oh, that you, transfer incredibly well to, to other ventures. To, to other jobs, yes. my I really thank my mother for my organizational skills. Mm -hmm. My mother was organized. Mm -hmm. She had to be. She had, she had three meals a day that she had to cook, and I'm talking cooking from scratch. Back then, they didn't have you know, the handiness that we have now where you can open a box and, mm -hmm. you know, make mac and cheese or or even frozen cheese nuggets or what or whatever you want to eat. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have that when I was a kid. Everything was made from scratch. And you had to know how to organize and how to prioritize what was the most important thing at that time to get done. And I feel that I learned that from my mother. And mm -hmm. I carried that through on my farm, in my farm life. Raising my children, I carried that through. I think I can see my daughter having many of my organizational skills mm -hmm. that that I have. Um, so yeah, I mean the way the way you're brought up, you carry that through life. Mm -hmm. You really do. And even like the kindness that my mother showed to people, mm -hmm. I I think I got that from her because I seen it firsthand. Can you share an amusing or heartwarming story from your experience on the farm that still brings a smile to your face? Okay. Um, oh, gosh. Okay. The, our farmhouse, before we remodeled it, was you came in the entrance. And believe it or not, you had to walk through the living room to get to the bathroom. Well, Okay. Let's be realistic. You're not going to be taking off your barn shoes every time. So I had plastic mats laid across that carpet area, right? Okay. Our kids, we caught them many times in the morning coming in when we were done with the morning chores and going to make breakfast. Sitting on those mats with a cup of milk and their peanut butter and honey sandwiches. Laying on the mat without... <laughs> plates underneath and it's like okay kids um if you want to do this that's fine but you have to put plates under your sandwiches well why it doesn't look dirty no it's dirty <laughs> oh yeah you, you look you think back and you just have to laugh and you think well they got a little bit more roughage that day i, I don't know what else to say i mean i don't know um the looking towards the future what do you hope for the next generation of farmers, and what advice would you give to those considering a life in agriculture, having had experience in it and out of it? Um, farming is so different now than, than when we were farming. Um, like, we had 65 cows. That was a pretty good number of cows back then. Now you're talking... They have literally thousands. Mm -hmm. It's it's a whole different operation. It is um, it's a business. It, mm -hmm. It's a big, big business, business. multi million dollar business. When I see these big farms, um, and we do have some here in Calumet County, I just shudder to wonder what how they make ends meet with the milk price and the cost of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, diesel fuel, fertilizer. I mean, I remember when we were farming, man, that, that took us three, four months to get to get those bills paid that we had delivered to our house in the springtime, you know. And I I don't know how they do it now. It it is you have to really love it. Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to love what you're doing because it is a 24 7 mm -hmm. job it really is um you really don't get a break not unless you make a break that you really take off and you hire somebody to do it mm -hmm. but it is you have to be dedicated and you have to want to work hard mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. it was that way when we farmed and it and it still is that way mm -hmm. yeah 
Well, Pauline, I want to thank you. Is there anything you'd like to share that we maybe didn't touch on? This is funny because um, you talk about neighbors helping neighbors. Okay, We had a terrible ice storm the one night, and the power was out. Okay, The whole neighborhood was out, was out of power. We did not have a generator, of course. So it landed up that our neighbor across the road, he was a mechanic. That's where we took all of our machine, our tractors, or whatever needed to be fixed, you know. We took it to him. And my husband thought that maybe there was a way that we could hook up to our car and get suction for the milker, the milk machines to work. And There's called, a true farmer. Yes, believe me. <laughs> my husband fixed everything, mm-hmm. fixed everything. Mm-hmm. So we called the neighbor across the road, and then he said, yeah. He said, that might work, Joe. He says, I'll be over. So I will never forget our brown Tornado car by the front door <laughs> of the barn having a long hose from, I don't even know what they hooked it up to in the car. <laughs> I really don't. But there was enough suction there that we could use one milk machine. Wow. And that is how we milked our cows that day. Um, the, I I don't remember when and the And if you didn't have that, you'd still be milking. <laughs> well, if we didn't have that, our cows would have been hurting. Uh, let me that's tell you. true. I mean, it, mm-hmm. it was not, that is not nothing that you want to laugh about because no. cows do hurt. Mm-hmm. Um, but we got them milked, and that was just one thing that, you know, there again, ingenuity, mm-hmm. hard work, the helping of your friends and your neighbors to make a go of it. Mm-hmm. And that's really what it amounts to. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you, Pauline. Well, you're welcome. Citizen of the year. Oh. We really appreciate it. <laughs> well, so thank you glad you could come I, in. I enjoy today. working here at the library. As do I. Yes. It's been a pleasure it, working yes. with you. Yeah. Thanks. So. As we bring this episode of Sharing Our Stories to a close, we want to express our gratitude to all the storytellers who generously shared a piece of their lives with us. Your stories have added depth and richness to the tapestry of our community, reminding us that every narrative, no matter how big or small, contributes to the beautiful mosaic of Chilton. If you have a story you'd like to share, or you've been inspired by today's episode, we encourage you to reach out. The Chilton Public Library is here to celebrate, preserve, and amplify the voices that make our town unique. Thank you for joining us on this storytelling journey. Until next time, keep listening, keep sharing, and keep the spirit of our community alive through the power of your stories. This was Sharing Our Stories.